Hey folks, today I've got your full in-depth review as well as 13 new things to know of the new Garmin 400 255. And this watch is a massive upgrade from the 245 in the past. There are tons of new features here and it's no longer just a running watch. It is a full multi-sport watch. And thus as part of that, I've been swim, bike, run, hike, all the things, putting it through its paces, figuring out where it works well and where it needs a little bit of love. So the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna run through all the newness and then we're gonna get into the accuracy bits and the final recommendations. And the first thing to know is there's actually two, actually four different versions of it. Uh, there are two different sizes. There's a new smaller size as well as a new larger size. So this here is the 255 and this is definitely not the 255S. I don't have one. I just got the 245, which is almost the same size. So to give you kind of a general ballpark here, this is officially known as the 46 mil and then the smaller 255S is known as a 42 mil. But they are the same price nonetheless at 349 for the non-music edition and 399 for the music edition. So again, there's two different versions, music and non-version in two different sizes, small and large. But beyond the battery life for the size and the music for the music version, the features are identical across the board. And one of the first new features to talk about is full multi-sport support. So in the past, there was things like pool swimming, but there wasn't full open water swimming or multi-sport. The idea to be able to string those together into one cohesive event, like a triathlon. So that is here now today, as well as support for cycling power meters, which was not in the previous 245 generation. So you can pair up to both a cycling power meter as well as an indoor trainer, and basically have a full triathlon experience. This is very similar to what Garmin did in the Instinct 2 series just a few months ago making it a full triathlon watch at a very similar price point. There are some nuanced differences though between the Forerunner and the Instinct series, and those differences are going to get jumbled up again over the next few weeks as the Instinct series gets a beta update, bringing in all the features I'm just about to talk about here for the Forerunner 255. Next up is the addition of multi-band or dual frequency GPS support. And this surprised me, I did not expect to see it at this price point, but Garmin is going like all in on this. Uh, and this is something we saw introduced with the Phoenix 7 Sapphire editions and the Epic Sapphire editions at nearly a thousand bucks. And now it's here at 349. So multi-band or dual frequency GPS is considered kind of like the holy grail of GPS accuracy. And we've seen continued improvements over the last few months. And probably one of the best examples of this is this run it in the business district with really tall 20 to 30 story buildings on tiny little streets going back and forth. And it like almost locks that perfectly. It is astounding how good that is, especially when I compare it to things like the 945 LTE, the Coros Vertex 2, the Polar Pacer Pro. None of those watches held a candle to either the 255 or the 955. They were just leagues apart in terms of accuracy. Speaking of increased accuracy, Garmin has added the Behrman check altimeter to this watch. It's the first time we've seen a Forerunner watch anywhere near this price point have this. This gives you more accurate data than the typical GPS-based altimeter we've seen in the past. One caveat though is you won't see Climb Pro on this. We've seen Climb Pro on the higher end watches. It hasn't quite worked its way down yet to either the Instinct 2 series or the 400 255. So if you want that, you have to jump up to something like the 745 or the 955 series. And actually a quick note before we get onto the next one, if you are finding this video interesting or useful or helpful or something like that, just simply whack that like button at the bottom. It really helps out this video and the channel quite a bit. Now, one of the things that's leveraging that barometric check altimeter is the addition of running power. Uh, this, along with the 955, is the first time we've seen Garmin have native running power in a watch. Uh, previously, it required a Connect IQ app, though this still does require a Garmin accessory. You have to have something like the RD pod here, or the older HRM run strap, or the HRM tri strap, or the HRM pro strap, uh, in order to get that running power to light up. But once you've got one of those accessories paired, you'll see running power on the screen and you can also customize running power zones different from cycling, as well as do structure workout based on running power, which is what I did actually earlier today for the structure workout to have my running power zones built into it. In terms of accuracy, it's the exact same as it was in the past. They've just taken that Connect IQ app for running power they used to have and shoved it into being native. So all the same caveats around accuracy still apply here, which is to say that there is no standard for running power accuracy out there. And anyone that says differently is simply trying to sell you something. Still, you can generally use any of these running power sources to pace relatively consistently, uh, and this is no different. Next up is the addition of nightly HRV tracking to the 255 as well as a 955. So what you see here is my nightly HRV V values last night. But the core thing to understand is this is actually trending over much longer time periods. If I go up in this widget or back in this widget, or however you want to phrase it, you see my HRV status there. And right now it doesn't show anything. And the reason for that is you need 19 days or roughly three weeks of data. And I have that, but there was a couple little beta bugs along the way that reset my counter. So instead I'm gonna show you the exact same thing on the 400 955. So you can see what it looks like once it fully populates again. 
So you see my HRV status right now. I'm in the balance zone, in that green zone. That zone is custom to me, and so it can be uh, wider for you or thinner for you, depending on how variable your HRV values are night to night. But this is established after the 19 days, and more importantly, then goes out to 90 days worth of data. So it's always comparing against much longer trends. Once I crack these open, I get the exact same thing. Uh, this one just simply has the colors already there. There's my HRV status last night. You'll notice that the HRV values vary quite a bit during the night, as well as there's differences between the different watches on different risks. Many factors influence HRV, including alcohol and sleep and fatigue and training and recovery. All the things that you might expect to slow down your body can impact HRV. And you see also here, these aren't the exact same. And the reason for that is it depends on which side of my body I'm lying on. So you can see different values throughout the night. Garmin's point, and this is something that's echoed kind of throughout the entire HRV realm, is that ultimately you're looking at longer term trends. One single night shouldn't be that big of a deal here. I can then go down as well and look at my uh, HRV trends over the last seven days. And you can see there's a relatively similar, except for last night, uh, being just a slightly bit different on the 955 compared to the 255. But again, it's all about longer term trending. Ultimately, the goal of all this, though, is to use HRV values as a bit of a long term gut check to see if you're trending in the right directions. And one of the ways it does that is every morning now when you wake up, you get a new morning report. On that morning report, it'll show you your sleep stats from last night, your current HRV status, as well as showing you what's coming up for the day from a workout standpoint, and even the weather. This is displayed every single morning. You can customize what's shown on it, or you can just get rid of it entirely. I find it pretty useful just to get a quickie look at things and figure out whether or not I'm going in the right direction. Speaking of directions, one of the cool things here is the addition of new race widgets. These widgets are kind of broken up into two different areas, the race calendar and the race itself. So looking at the race calendar, you can see I've got a race on Friday here, Montmont 2 versus Des. And then below that, I've got a race in July, which is a running race. I've also got a triathlon in between those two, but the race calendar doesn't support that quite yet, so it's not actually showing up at all. All of these are ones that I've added to my Garmin Connect calendar. Uh, when you do that, you can search for existing events, which pulls in stuff from active.com, or you can just create your own event, real or otherwise. You can add in a course, location, etc., And that then surfaces a lot of the information you see here. So as I crack this one open in Paris, uh, it's in five weeks and four days, so the countdown at the top there, I press down once. Uh, this is the estimated finish time based on my current VO2 max and the current distance for this particular course. Going again, I can see what the average temperature is for that particular uh, day and location and time. So at uh, 8 a.m., it's normally about 16 degrees Celsius, the high for the day, the low for the day. Uh, and then here, this is the course profile. And then here, this is the overall course itself. Again, these are all things that loaded into Garmin Connect beforehand. Now, as we get closer to an event, if we go back here, uh, back to this upcoming race, you can see right here, this is three days away, Montmont 2 versus Des. I cracked this open, and now I can see the exact weather for this day. So right there, if I go down once, I can see at 9 a.m., it's going to be 23 degrees, and it'll eventually kind of get a bit sunnier by about 11 a.m. I can go down again, and I can see the course there. However, with a cycling event, I will not get the predictive stuff that I would on the running side. That's not there today. It sounds like that's probably coming down the road pretty quickly here. So for now, the predictive stuff is just on the running events. Now, unless you think this is just some fun little widget to look at for counting down onto your race, you'd be wrong. There's a substantial overhaul behind the scenes under the covers on what happens when you add something to your calendar. What it's doing is it's actually building out your entire training plan, even if you don't even know it's there. So to show you the depth of that, let me go back here and just crack open a run. So there's the run profile, I choose that, and this is the daily suggested workout. Up until now, the whole point of daily suggested workouts on Grummer devices was just to kind of keep you fit, but it had no like idea of what your goal was down the road. So no idea if you're running a marathon or just a 5K, there's nothing wrong with a 5K, but to kind of show the scope of those two. But now when I tap this, I'm gonna go down here and you'll see more suggestions. And right now you see build phase, meaning this is the build phase to the event that I have right there. Uh, so May 21st through June 6th. Then there's a peak phase right there. Then there's a taper phase. And then there's my, my race. And of course my friend doesn't know he's racing me when I get down to Paris, but he is and he's gonna find out the hard way. But what you see here is that not only all these phases there, but each week is gonna create those workouts. So you can actually see some of these workouts ahead of time. So these are the next few days, today, tomorrow, Thursday's a rest day. It's got Friday as my event day for the other cycling event. So it knows to do a rest day in between there. And then after that, it thinks I wanna do a long run. Might be a bit of a jump between those two, but again, it's not too bad of a course in the grand scheme of things for that uh, ride. And then Sunday, and then Monday, and so on. Now what's notable here is in the settings, I can change my long workout day. So I can choose this here and say, hey, I want my long workouts to be on maybe Thursday or Friday as opposed to Saturday or Sunday. And I can also change my target type 
from pace to heart rate, and as well as pause the trending altogether. If I'm like, you know what, just, just shut up Garmin, just let me do my own thing, you can do that here as well. And then ultimately all of this impacts everything throughout the watch, including things like trending status. Right now it's unproductive for what I'm doing uh, based on in part what I'm planning on doing down the road in terms of an event. So this is a good time to talk about trending status. Uh, I'm unproductive because that's the camp I live in. Uh, in theory, this should start going away as my HRV values start to pull in here, as well as my VO2 max values get more correct uh, the more weeks that I wear the watch. Uh, generally speaking, you look about four to six weeks on the watch uh, worth of workouts before you get those VO2 max values back to where you want them to be. If I go down though, you can see here's my acute load. This is the trending load over the last seven days. Uh, you can see that green area is what's called a tunnel, the portion that I should be in ideally from an ideal training load standpoint. Uh, and if I tap this up here, you can see my acute load is a little bit high uh, above the optimal range, considering adding more time to recover. We'll do that after I beat Des on Friday. Uh, and then here's my exercise load, uh, showing you the anaerobic, high aerobic, and low aerobic over the last seven days. If I tap back again, you can see the load focus. Again, the same sort of load focus that we just saw a second ago, but now trended over four weeks. And then if I tap this again, uh, you can see my overall load is high. Try scaling it back a little bit. And then the rest of these components are things we've seen before, uh, VO2 max, except now you actually get it for cycling. In the past, you just would have seen running. Keep in mind the cycling VO2 max does require a power meter though. Uh, and then going on down, HRV status and recovery. This is the recovery time until your next hard workout. Uh, not until your next workout, this is your next hard workout. I did a hard workout just about six hours ago of intervals. Uh, so that's why it's pretty high right now. So now switching up to something entirely different, which is the ability to do phone-based config of all the settings on the watch. Every data field, every data page, you can now configure it using your phone as opposed to having to press all the little buttons. You can still press all the little buttons if you want to, but you can see on the screens right there, you can just do it from your phone and be off and running. After that, for those of you that are exploring on courses, there's a new up ahead feature. This was introduced with the Phoenix 7. And I did not expect to see this here as well on the 255. This shows you any of the waypoints that you've defined in Garmin Connect on that course. You can see right here a couple waypoints I've created on this particular course and the distances to those waypoints based on the course routing. So not just as the crow flies, but your actual course routing that's defined in that course profile. Waypoints as a concept are not new, but having it on one consolidated little page is super useful, especially for the longer courses. And when you do get to one of those waypoints that may be a cafe, you can use a new Garmin Pay as well. So holding the upper left hand button right there, I can access my wallet, it's up in the corner. Here we go, the wallet, I then enter my super secret passcode. I can't show you that. And then boom, there's my Visa card already stored into that, and I can tap onto any contactless NFC reader uh, and pay for things. Of course, this does depend on your bank supporting this. Uh, bank and not your credit card, Not it's not all Visa cards, it's not all Amex, whatever, it is just your particular bank. And then finally, before we talk about accuracy, let's talk about battery life. Here's a quick battery life chart. Uh, essentially, you have different battery life depending on whether you're the 42 or the 46, because the 46 is bigger. Uh, and you can see that the GPS goes all the way up to 30 hours in the base GPS mode and up to 14 days in standby watch mode. That is double what it had on the 245. So a huge increase in battery for that standby mode. So at this point, let's talk about accuracy of the GPS and the heart rate and no better place to do that than on the computer. Starting off on this relatively steady state workout, the 955 and the 255 were spot on across the board here, zero problems at all. However, switching to this interval workout, they actually had a rough go in the first couple minutes in the warm up, which is sort of odd. Yet the complex part, these 20 by 20 second sprint repeats, they nailed across the board every single one perfectly. So I'm not sure what happened there in the very beginning. Another interval workout here, four by 400s, uh, very high intensity, and then four by 800s, high intensity, zero problems. Transitioning into an indoor trainer workout with a slew of intervals spot on across the board. Actually even beating out the ticker chest strap at the very beginning there. Uh, the same is true for yet another, this one was a Peloton workout. And then here is an outside ride in the very middle of the red section is I was doing some filming, so just ignore that. But if we look across the rest of the ride, it's relatively fine. There's some kind of wobbles towards the end as I get back into the city with cobblestones and stuff like that. Uh, but overall, it is mostly acceptable for an outdoor bike ride. Next, we're gonna start off right in the swim for the GPS accuracy. And you can see here, the 255 and the 955 are virtually identical. I actually think the 255 went into base GPS mode here, a couple little quirks, uh, but I don't think it was actually in multiband correctly. Either way, super impressive. Going into the forested areas here, it just gets super boring because it's perfect. The 255 and the 955 are spot on across the board. Another round here out into kind of some farmlands with some bridges and whatnot, spot on. But here is when things get fun. This is a run that had all sorts of goodness in it, including the city section I showed you earlier. 
What I want you to look at here is all the variation the GPS tracks from the Polar Pacer Pro, the Coros Vertex 2, even Garmin's own 945 LTE is sort of everywhere. But as I peel that away and show you just the 255 and 955 tracks, they are very, very clean. In this case, I think the 255 again had multiband churned off for some reason due to firmware update. Uh, but overall, it's very, very close to where I actually ran. This despite having giant buildings on the side of me. Uh, again, super, super impressive GPS accuracy across the board here from both units. Okay, so there you go. A complete look at the 400 255. Overall, it is an astounding, impressive watch for the money. Uh, again, we saw so many features added to the Instinct 2 series just a few months ago, making it a full triathlon watch, a full multi-sport watch. And this takes that and really elevates it actually kind of beyond that. Even more impressive given the fact that this has a multi-band GPS and the Instinct 2 series doesn't. Still, fear not for you InSync 2 folks that just bought a unit there. Uh, you are getting a number of the software features over the next little while. Expect to see those in beta first very shortly. So check out my beta video up in the corner there for how to sign up for the Garmin beta system. Uh, that way you can test those features uh, as soon as they hit the beta side. And it's worthwhile noting if you want to see a complete guide, a complete beginner's guide, whatever you want to call it for the 400 255, I'm working on that now. Expect it in just a couple of days. Tomorrow you'll see the 955 beginner's guide or complete guide. And then after that, the 255 one. And as usual, if you found this video interesting or useful, just hit the like button at the bottom there. It really helps quite a bit. Have a good one.